Okay, so for the final of these three sessions, um, what I wanted to talk about was actually selling a story, right? How to place this idea that you've been developing with an actual outlet. Um, as a sort of recap, uh, you know, we have been talking about how to create compelling written uh, science communication for the last few weeks. And where we opened on what a story is or could be, you'll remember those sort of story formulas we walked through. We then moved into kind of the more granular detail of how you actually practice the craft of science writing and start to um, put those ideas you know, on the page. This sort of next step is gonna be about essentially getting your idea out there um, and all of the work that is involved in that. So I wanted to start by kind of framing it where if we talked about story formulas, which you'll see um, you know, on this, for, uh, this sort of first category, and we've talked about identifying your audience, the last step is identifying your outlet. And so outlet here just meaning, you know, um, some sort of publication where uh, your story will be showcased and, you know, sort of shared um, with readership. So I've used a few of these terms, you know, in uh, previous sort of uh, workshops where we've talked about the idea of trade publications. So those are publications that are writing specifically to um, a particular field. So usually sort of at the merger of science and business, you might recall, um, we read a story about the Hubble telescope from Optics and Photonics News. That was a trade publication. A lot about sort of mainstream newspapers and magazines. And then, of course, there are always the sort of institutional side of things in terms of, you know, very formal science communication coming out of museums, uh, universities, um, and, and other sort of institutions that do scientific research. And then there's also, you know, a million sort of ways to do this yourself. Um, technology has kind of democratized these platforms. So there are, you know, blogs, newsletters, um, and other kind of self-publishing arms. But this is where we'll be focusing this sort of third category today on how to get your work, um, you know, in front of an audience. And that's where the outlet really comes in. So to do this, the sort of standard is to create what's called a pitch. Um, and I've been using this word, you know, all along the way, but I wanted to talk today and really drill in to what makes a good pitch. And similar to our conversations in the past, if you have any questions that you want to keep tabs on, you can drop them in the chat. And I have a few marked spots for discussion, um, but we will talk sort of about pitches um, for the next 20, 25 minutes, and then we can have a little bit of a break and, and go over any questions. Um, but when we talk about a good pitch, so a pitch is uh, essentially a written you know, kind of missive, right? It's an email between you and an editor. And so if a story has an audience of, you know, other scientists or, um, you know, lay adults or children, your pitch has an audience of one and that's the editor you're pitching, right? You're just trying to write directly to them in the most efficient, helpful way possible and say, this is a story that you want to run in your magazine, newspaper, you know, blog, what have you. So a good pitch is going to have elements of craft, it will showcase your writing style, right? Because this person probably hasn't heard from you before, you're just kind of getting in touch. And you're saying like, I can do this. And this entire pitch, right, this, this email is a little bit more stylized than a typical email we might send in a work day, because I'm trying to show you my voice and my perspective. Um, and you know, my, my sort of word choice and all of these considerations that we've talked about um, in previous weeks. The most important thing it will do, though, is communicate the crux of your story. So if you have identified, you know, sort of your headline and your nut graph, um, you have everything that you need for a pitch because all you're trying to communicate is just that very distilled sort of point of like, this is what the piece is about, ideally in just a few sentences. And then you're also going to try to start to put your story in context for this editor. Um, in theory, right, you would be pitching them because maybe they have shown a demonstrated interest in this topic before, or because the story formula that you want to apply to your science topic is something that they publish a lot of. And so you're going to try to help them start to see how this story fits into the rest of the work that they're doing. So you want to kind of frame your piece in terms of existing writing on the topic, um, you know, or styles you admire and sort of make references, right, to, to sort of what you're aspiring to do here, given the current kind of ecosystem of science communication more generally. 
then what you'll do is because you're not turning in a full draft of your story, you'll need to essentially summarize what that story might be. So you want to offer clear next steps. Um, you've identified, you know, the crux of the story, and now here is how you will take, um, you know, further action to make that story realized. And then the last thing that you need to do is it needs to tell a little bit about why you're the right person for the job. Um, you know, obviously, uh, a lot of people, um, you know, want to do science communication, and I really do believe that there is room for all of us, but an editor is going to be looking for a pitch that just sort of communicates to them in a sort of quick glance that not only this is a story uh, that is going to appeal to them and to their audience, but also that they found the person to do it, right? Because in theory, any of us could write about anything, but my James Webb telescope story would be very bad because I don't know that much about astronomy. So if you have some sort of expertise or perspective that is going to make you like the ideal person on this topic, why not say that? So these are kind of the elements that we're gonna be looking for. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about pitches um, and then we're gonna go into some case studies as we have in the past and look at how pitches actually work. So this is my pitch formula that I use um, just to kind of bring those ideas, those bullet points together into a structure. Um, I have, you know, sort of pleasantries. I kind of put this as if this was a pitch that y'all were sharing with someone where it's like, I'm a graduate student, you know, I'm researching and writing about these topics and I have a story that I think would be a great fit for you or some, you know, sort of pleasantries along those lines setting up this story. Um, as we've discussed, a headline is really important, both as a litmus test for you as a writer to say, have I figured out my piece enough that I can distill it into a few words, and also to communicate efficiently to an editor who's busy juggling a million other things that they need to sort of narrow in here, keep reading, something interesting's coming. The first graph is going to explain the gist of the story, right? I have the inverted pyramid photo here again, because it is going to be operating the same way, like most important information, like get it in there up top. Um, the second graph is going to, as I said, sort of bring in those elements that reinforce that this piece is something that needs to be written now, it's very timely, um, that it's going to offer something no one else has. But that also, you know, ideally, it's part of a sort of area of interest um, or, you know, budding area of concern. So people will want to read it. it it's part of kind of, I guess, like an, an kind of like intellectual, um, you know, history or ecosystem. Then the third graph is going to be where you kind of put everything together in terms of your next steps. So if I've said to you, you know, I'm, I've identified this story, no one has covered it, um, but it's super important because it relates to, you know, all of these urgent issues like climate change and the pandemic all at once. Then what you need to say here is, you know, in a, let's say, thousand word essay for your site, I'm going to talk to these experts, um, you know, assemble these sort of, uh, you know, histories or um, examples or studies that illustrate my point and show by assembling this all together why this matters so much. And I'm the right person to do it because I have, you know, a PhD in this, or because this is something that I've been following for five years, it's my secret passion. Um, all of that goes into that sort of last graph that you wanna be really succinctly just summing up what it is you can do. And then, you know, some additional pleasantries here, right? About continuing the conversation because almost never will someone say, yes, absolutely. I have no questions. Do exactly what you said in your email. <laughs> They're going to say, this is really interesting. I'd like to know more. Can you answer a few additional questions for me? Um, you know, can we talk more about this? So you want to kind of treat it as, um, as an entry point into a conversation about what a piece could be. One way that I think you can think about how this is all fitting together with what we've talked about in the past, is that if there's scientific writing, which I have here, you know, sort of the outline of a typical journal article, then there's science writing. And that is a, a sort of translation of a lot of those same ideas. A pitch is the abstract, right? It's essentially kind of condensing in a stylized and approachable way, all of the information that will go into the longer story. Um, so, you know, we have that headline and then we just kind of have this hyper compressed, like coal to diamond sort of moment where we say, um, you know, this is the idea. These are sort of my, you know, methods, like how I'm going to go about this. And then here's the sort of larger context in which it fits into. Um, 
So as you look through these case studies that we'll do now, um, you know, kind of keep this formula in mind if it's helpful for you or think about, you know, kind of the news pyramid, um, you know, whatever resonates. Um, but we're really looking to distill. So the first example that I have here is I wanted to do one that's sort of about uh, a study story, um, since that, as we've discussed, is kind of the bread and butter of science communication, a new study has been released. Let's talk about what the scientists found. So I selected um, from this amazing database, I encourage you to look for yourself. They have hundreds of these examples, right, of pitches that have been successfully turned into stories um, from the open notebook. And so the pitch I picked for the study story example is fairly recent. Um, it published in the New York Times and it's a story about lizard body temperature changes. And so what we have here is we have the pitch where um, this freelancer, uh, Richard, is writing to an editor at the New York Times. And so, you know, he kind of opens up, he says, I, you know, I hope you're doing well in this stressful time. And then he gets right to the point of he's saying he's pitching a news story and he's pitching it for trilobites, which is a section in the New York Times that does study coverage, um, especially about sort of natural world content. And it's about a study that just published. So right here, he's given already kind of like a clear roadmap for what he wants the story to be, where it would fit into this editor's, um, you know, sort of publication and a sense of timeliness. And then he begins to lay out for us an overview of the study and its findings. So he says in a study spanning four decades, researchers discovered that lizards living on snake infested islands had hotter body temperatures than those on snake free islands. And he characterizes that difference for us, which adds up to um, 4.2 degrees Celsius, um, which is really significant as these researchers, you know, aim to show. And so he starts to put this into a larger context for us by talking about how this is correlated in part with climatic warming, um, so it's already kind of fitting into a bigger picture, even though it's a very specific detail and an actionable story to be writing about. And then he starts to describe some of the work that was done, both in terms of key takeaways, the idea that there's a predator selection unfolding, but also just in terms of some of those human elements that we've talked about all the way through. Where he says that the scientists literally put these lizards on a wooden racetrack to study them, um, which is just one of those things that you can't help but smile at. Um, and then he, after laying out this story in these two graphs here, says, coming full circle, I think this story about how different selection pressures influence animal physiology and in turn animal behavior would be of interest to New York Times science readers. This study also has potential implications on how future climate change could affect other predator prey relations. So he's saying it's very specific to you, but it also has these general applications. Um, and that's a good sell for an editor, right? Who's trying to make sure that they're serving their audience well. And then he says a little bit about me. And here, um, Richard does have a PhD um, and a scientific background. Here, he just chose to say, you know, that he writes regularly about life and environmental science for these outlets. So if we go to his actual story, here it is. It appeared in Trilobites, just as he planned. Um, it appears at the headline, these lizards have a hot trick to escape hungry snakes, which is a pretty fun way of kind of summing up, right, the research that he's described. And then what I think you'll notice is that he immediately goes into this kind of narrative lead, which we did not see in the pitch. It could have appeared in the pitch if he'd already had the story of Masami Hasegawa, the researcher, to share. But Whatever sort of happened between the pitch and the story means that he was able to talk to the main researcher on the study and kind of paint a portrait of how this person has been going for more than 40 years back and forth to these islands to conduct this research. And so we get this kind of, you know, just very sweet and human scale um, kind of opener. And then Richard begins to detail as we move along um, some of the implications of this research um, and what it is exactly that the researchers have found. So we get this sort of nut graph here that says after more than 40 years of study, Dr. Hasegawa and his co colleagues have published evidence that explains that the lizard body temperature are warming and that their legs are growing too. Um, and then he says, you know, this researcher, this research has been published. And as he described in his um, pitch, the study has implications for how we think about predator prey relationships in a warming world. 
Um, and so from there, you know, he sort of elaborates on sort of uh, the research and the findings, the research and the findings toggling back and forth between these big and small scale stories. Um, but basically, I think that's a really effective example of how uh, a pitch is a just sort of you know, condensed version of what a story could be. And more than anything, trying to hook an editor um, on the idea that like, this is something worth pursuing. For the next example that I wanted to run through, I chose um, an op-ed as an example. And this one, I wanted to do the story first, and then we'll look at the pitch in reverse. Um, I think toggling back and forth is helpful because you know most times you'll be sort of working on them simultaneously and they'll inform each other, right? Your story and your pitch. So this is an opinion piece um, in The Scientist. And so you know the opinion is neuroscientists need to think about sex bias. The story begins with a kind of personal lead where um, Nora Wolcott, the writer has experience doing this research, um, you know, they are neuroscientists. And so it says, when I began studying the neural circuitry underlying spatial navigation in the fall of 2019, I expected that my experimental trajectory would be fairly straightforward. Read up on what others had done before me, find the gaps and try to fill them. But as I started my research, it became clear that there was one gap that was much bigger than I had anticipated. In seeking a research focus, a new question had appeared, where are the women? And so, you know, it's this kind of very engaging sort of lead where one scientist is sort of writing to another, right? This is sort of imminently relatable because we've all had those experiences of trying to identify research topics, but it starts to build tension by saying, uh, you know, things did not go as expected and gets right into the premise of her piece, which is that there is, uh, you know, profound sex bias in neuroscience research um, from, you know, animal models upwards. And so this piece is, you know, fairly uh, short and straightforward. It talks us through some of the problems um, and then, you know, begins to kind of talk about a little bit of a way forward, um, talking about how, you know, there is going to be greater scrutiny in a post pandemic world and that this is really the time and opportunity to start creating more um, accessible, uh, accurate and applicable scientific research. So that's the gist of Nora's argument. So if we go backwards and look at how Nora turned this idea into a pitch, what we get is a pitch to the scientist. Um, and they begin, you know, across scientific disciplines, the proportion of female animals included in biomedical research has steeply risen. Despite this massive, pro pro mm, despite this massive progress, almost half of all rodent studies are still conducted solely in male subjects. Um, and neuroscience is among the worst defenders, um, offenders kind of talking about, you know, these misconceptions. So what I would imagine is because Nora really just sets up the context for you here, right? This is a, a really solid lead and then sets up an argument for you here, which is what's necessary when you're pitching an opinion piece. I think that probably the editor got to this point in the piece and read that Nora is a PhD student um, in you know, MCDB and was like, oh, interesting. Like, would you be willing to talk about your first person experience with it and structure the story around it? So I, I think that that's probably how we got to a story where just to go back, we end up with this very personal experience of sort of identifying a gap in the literature and that being the sort of scaffolding for the rest of the piece to talk about how and why this gap exists and what can be done about it. So once again, you know, there's kind of a constant iteration and conversation between these two pieces of writing being the pitch and the final product. The pitch is always going to be um, more direct um, and editor focused example of what it is you could do in a piece for your target audience. The final example I wanted to give, we'll start with the pitch again this time, um, was for a sort of multimedia feature um, in the Smithsonian um, last year about microbiologists using um, pathogens to create art. And so we get a pitch that begins with Sorry, as you can see here, a headline, the artsy agro artists of microbial worlds, um, which is, you know, a fun kind of way of setting the tone and letting the uh, editor know that you have kind of a perspective on this and a little bit of a, a style and craft that you're bringing to the story. 
And then it says, you know, it opens with this idea of um, a very specific person that we're focusing in on um, and talking about Balram Kalmari's uh, prize winning um, agar art, right? So just very interesting, like who's ever heard of this? I wanna know more, it draws you in. And then talks very specifically about how this work is done and uses Kamari as sort of the through line by saying, this is the person who's gonna guide us through, tell us about this art because he's doing it. And then says really clearly that this person believes that this is gonna be an 800 word story on the context, the focus um, being on sort of the challenges of growing these microbes and then applying them in an artistic concept. Um, context. And, you know, finally sort of ends with this idea of being really clear that I'm going to get in touch with him. I'm going to get quotes. I have, and I have dabbled with these myself. Um, the, the writer concludes, which is sort of a fun way, right, of establishing that not only is there a kind of scientific expertise, but also just someone who, um, you know, is understands like the practice of this agar art that they're gonna be explaining to an audience who has probably never heard of these things before. So when we open up this story, they ended up taking it as I would have expected. And perhaps you might also, you know, be predicting now in a direction of being a very visual piece because this is like something that you really wanna look at. So this is full of these, like frankly, very cool, um, artworks from a, a bunch of different participants in this contest, not only um, the, the sort of focus of the story, but, but other people who participated, just getting a bunch of beautiful art in there. But the story itself does focus, um, as was promised, on Balaram Kumari. Um, we have almost, let's kind of go back here. We have you know, a very similar sort of lead in the pitch to what we get in this final story, right? Where it's opening on um, this 26 year old bespectacled microbiologist, but it goes much deeper into sort of the narrative writing, sets him up as a character, and then introduces us to microbial art and its practice. Whereas the pitch understands that what matters most is communicating to the editor that microbial art is happening. Um, and, you know, just getting this message across that this is cool, this hasn't been written about, let's get a story out there. So all of those are just three examples out of almost 300 in the Open Notebook Pitch Database. So if you want to take you know, your own time to go spelunking through, there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, but hopefully that starts to give you a good sense of kind of the potential of a pitch. Um, I want to pause here for questions um, or comments. Um, yeah, what does everybody think about sort of the, the idea of pitching so far. I have a question from Austin. What is the best way for a writer to establish their credibility when pitching to an editor for the first time and with no prior publications? Um, that is a great question. I think that cold pitching can definitely be challenging, right? Because you don't necessarily have a, any guarantee that the editor is going to open the email. And I think honestly, that's the biggest hurdle is getting your email opened. Um, once it's opened, I think what you would need to do to sort of convince them that while you don't have any clips yet, you are going to be able to execute on this is to just make sure that your pitch is on the probably the more narrative side. I think that we've saw examples, right, of pitches without leads and pitches with leads. And I think if you're going in sort of cold pitching and you don't have a lot of clips to show your previous work, it's probably best to actually write out an engaging lead that shows off your writing style before getting into some of these details. And obviously that's a little bit of a compromise, right? Because like so much about pitching is about being efficient, but I do think that you've kind of identified a hurdle to clear, right? Which is just that sort of the editor's confidence in your abilities. Um, and so taking a little bit more time to kind of communicate to them, um, you know, here I am, here's what I can do, I think is a, a good approach. Um, so Claire says that, uh, yeah, similar experience, um, prior publications, but it's been years. I don't think that that should um, discourage anybody, you know, the passage of time from including those. Um, if you feel like they're good clips, I don't think it really matters how old they are um, or where they were published or if they were self-published. Um, I think that the real goal is always just to be communicating potential because that's really all an editor is agreeing to, right? Is to like work with you on what could be a great story. And so you don't have to have, you know, 
you don't already have to have a New York Times piece or something to say, I can do this. You just have to kind of communicate to them why you're the right person for it um, and the work that you've already put in to the pitch. Um, okay, so Sherry has asked, how often does an editor accept the pitch and then not run the story? So yeah, this is called um, killed, when your story has been killed. And it does feel like that, it feels like a stone cold murder. Um, I would say that the uh, sort of rate at which that happens is fairly low. And the context in which it happens is usually not because the editor is like totally dissatisfied with the story that you turned in, um, but because some set of priorities has changed within their newsroom. Um, so for example, the most recent story I had killed was because um, in between the assignment and the story being turned in, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And those kinds of things just like divert newsroom priority, right? There's a sort of new set of, of um, up to do list items. Um, and so that, that story ended up being, getting killed. Um, in the second half of the session today, we'll talk sort of about the, the kind of business components of um, pitching and science writing more generally. Um, but there is something called a kill fee that you can negotiate for um, just to make sure that your work is still partially compensated even if it doesn't end up published. So I have, let's see, another question here. Um, could academic conference submissions work as a good pitch for previous publications? I think it depends on how sort of well-written you think it is in terms of the match with the style of the outlet that you're pitching. My sense is that if you sort of, yeah, if you feel like something that you've written is good, even, even if it's like fiction, even if you like took a fiction class for fun and wrote some good fiction, um, you know, any of that can sort of be um, added as an example of, of the work that you're doing. Um, and I think that academic conference submissions could count if you feel like they kind of fall into that bucket. Um, I also think too that it's okay to be upfront with people as you're just getting started and be like, I don't have a lot of clips to my name, um, but you know, I've really worked to develop this. Um, you know, you can even sort of like name check mentors. Like for example, if I helped you with your pitch, like feel free to say so, you know, and, and kind of show your work a little bit. Um, I think that people are willing to take a chance on a great story. Um, I think that editors are just thrilled when something really fresh comes in and they are willing to gamble in those cases, um, you know, to, to kind of bring it to fruition. And once you catch the flywheel, right, and you have more and more clips, it gets easier and easier to just tell people like, I can do this work. Um, awesome. So Mark says, obviously not the only reason we'd be pitching a story, but what does say a thousand words story pay? Okay, so we will definitely talk about that in the second half, we will get into money. Um, are there any other questions though, like on sort of the craft of the pitch um, that I can answer at this stage? Okay, okay, cool. What I will say additionally is just that pitching is really, Hard. I think it's kind of strange to be as maybe sort of self-promotional um, and kind of fake it till you make it confident as pitching requires. I don't think that even people who are full-time science communicators always feel comfortable with that aspect of the job. Um, and I, I think that, you know, for that reason, it can be something that if, if you feel that way about it, just sort of treat it as if it's a a different set of responsibilities and kind of unlinked from you, right? It's, it's a business task, not a creative task so much. So have your checklists, you know, have your sort of business hat on um, and be like, we're just gonna get a little, a little self-promotional, a little excited, you know, um, maybe, you know, over promise just the slightest bit, right? Like, like put yourself in that kind of mindset of like anything's possible. Um, Claire, asks in terms of headlines, is it okay to pitch more than one as a potential? Um, especially too, if you're trying to pitch one that's maybe more catchy or gimmicky and another that's more clean or straightforward. Um, I think that for the purposes of the sort of email pitch, the ideal would be to have um, just one headline because an editor ultimately is not going to use your headline when they run the story. It's really more a way of framing for them, um, you know, your sort of idea. And so I think that you should pick the one that you just think is most clearly kind of communicating what it is you're after. And obviously when writing a headline, you know, spend a lot of time looking at the outlet you're targeting and see how they write their headlines. Everyone sort of has different styles. And while that curiosity gap 
rule is sort of universal, um, you can glean a lot just by sitting on someone's homepage and like looking at all of the headlines of the day at one time. So I just send one along. And then later on, when you have your story assigned and you're working on the draft, I think in the draft phase, sending three is ideal. Like your editor will be so grateful to have so much to riff on. So more is better then, but for the purposes of a pitch, I'd keep it as streamlined as possible. But that's a great question. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so if there are any other questions at this stage, we definitely have time to tackle them. Um, but I can start moving on to the sort of business aspects of this. So to go back to this slide presentation, um, we have, great. So what I wanted to do was to pick up where the pitch leaves off, right? So let's say you sent in your pitch, the editor opened the email, thank God. Um, they wrote back, they were excited. They maybe asked you a few follow-up questions and now they've assigned your story. So these are sort of the next steps. Um, the first is to negotiate your rate. We'll talk about money. Um, to sign your contract, which is a whole can of worms um, that we can get into some detail about. Then to write the rest of the story, right? And actually sort of make good on this pitch that you've shared. Um, to go through the editing process to refine the piece so that it can be published. And then of course, to share and promote your story once it's out. So in terms of rates, um, there is a huge range, uh, as you can see here, from uncompensated work um, all the way to a dollar or more a word. And in my experience, the sort of middle ground here, this digital journalism line, is probably most typical. So the 30 to 50 cents a word um, is the range that you will probably be looking at in, like I'm thinking like, you know, so many of the examples that we've used in this class um, of, you know, Slate, um, other sort of like mainstream, uh, you know, lay audience sites are in this range. Um, however, there are definitely cases in which you'll be paid a lot more potentially. Those tend to be with um, print journalism. So newspapers, major newspapers, by which I really mean sort of like the New York Times and the Washington Post that are doing, you know, international coverage. And then also um, magazines that are going to print um, often are more in that dollar a word range. Um, the same is true of some online publications that are also legacy magazines, like National Geographic tends to advertise in that dollar a word range as well. Um, the same is true of, of sort of content creation. So that's kind of like the, the sort of, you know, the dark side, um, I think people kind of jokingly say, but is when you're writing content about science or other topics, um, specifically for business purposes, those tend to be some of the best paid jobs around. You know, if you were to really go into um, sort of writing as a large part of your income, typically what people do is augment their sort of formal science communication with these content creation jobs. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the higher band. Um, Often though, as much as people talk in the per word range, um, you will be offered a flat fee most of the time. So an editor is gonna say, you know, I think this is to Mark's question, a thousand dollar, sorry, a thousand word story. I'm gonna pay you $500 on that 50 a word logic. But if the story ends up being 1200 words, that's just the way it is. And that's what I mean about this idea of a signed word count or final word count being very different. Um, so, you know, if you wanna have that conversation up front about, I want, you know, 50 cents a word from the final word count, that's a conversation you can have, but what most people mean is the assigned word count. So they sort of scoped it out at a thousand words and you're gonna get paid accordingly. Um, and so that often comes in a flat fee. And then of course, there's also a conversation to be had around sort of expenses. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, if you need to travel for a piece, if you're going to be um, buying a bunch of books you can't get at the library to do research, all of those are things that you'll wanna to talk to upfront about your editor. Uh, with your editor about, because there isn't necessarily um, a set sort of standard across the industry of how expenses are dealt with. And so you really can't assume 
as unfortunate as this is going to sound, um, you can't assume that your expenses will be covered. And so if you are going to be taking on expenses, you want to have a conversation about what can be expensed um, or else you will end up, you know, writing a story for $500 and spending $500 reporting it. So definitely important to be careful. Um, but these are, you know, all so variable according to the place. But I think like having that 50 cents a word kind of anchor is what I would recommend for everyone going forward as it's kind of the middle ground. And so if somebody offers you less, you can ask for more and then you can assess whether or not you want to take an opportunity that doesn't pay, um, you know, 50 cents a word. And if someone offers you more, you can be extremely delighted as I am every time that happens. So to kind of move on from the rate anchoring question, I wanted to talk a little bit about contracts. So contracts are also something that are highly variable, um, you know, depending on the publication and the context in which you are writing. But I think that there are a few things to look out for. So if you were to be writing for a mainstream um, news outlet, whether that's a newspaper, a website, or a magazine, the odds are that you will be a work for hire um, contract uh, sort of employee. And, and basically what that means is that they have no obligations to you <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but what really matters about work for hire is that it typically means that your contract is defaulting to the publication owning in perpetuity all rights to your content that you're creating. And so it's very important that you have a sense of what content you need to own and that you are clear about that upfront and don't sign contracts that take that away from you because that will be the default in most of these cases. Um, you know, in my sort of experience, there are situations where I'm comfortable with that. Maybe the editor reached out to me about a story and it's really their idea and it's not something that, um, you know, I, I'm super precious about and I'll sign a contract that's a work for hire agreement in which they're taking the rights. But there are also a lot of cases where it's something that I've developed, I really care about, um, that, you know, maybe one day I'd want to put into a book. And so I want to own the rights to that. Um, and that's in, you know, a situation in which I negotiate for rights. And one of the ways that you can negotiate for rights is this distinction between all rights versus first rights. So most contracts are going to default to an all rights model um, because it is a lot easier for the publication. So they're going to say, you know, we own all rights to this content forever in any context, language, translation, you know, excerpt, et cetera. Um, but you can ask for something called first rights, which is where they will own those rights for an exclusive period of time, and then the rights will revert back to you. And that's my number one suggestion is if you're presented with an all rights work for hire contract, ask for first rights. And that would mean that, you know, maybe for three months, the um, publication owns the work, but ultimately the copyright will uh, revert back to you. Um, and so I really encourage, you know, people to just read your contracts carefully and ask for advice from other people. Um, you know, you can always shoot me an email about contracts and I will respond as quickly as I can um, because there are always new things that companies are sort of testing out um, and trying to kind of spring on freelance writers. And so uh, it's really important that you just sort of look out for yourself in terms of the rights that you might want to maintain. Another thing that you will see in, um, a lot of work for hire agreements is the idea that not only is your publication not indemnifying you should you be sued for your work, which obviously is very rare, but is a concerning possibility, um, but your publication is having you indemnify them, um, which would mean that you essentially take on all sort of like legal liability for the work that you create together. And this is another sort of thing that I think people need to just be really aware of upfront. I think there's like a 0.0001% chance it would ever become relevant. But if you feel like you're working on, um, you know, a, a controversial story with litigious characters involved, it's really important to also be asking about indemnification and be working toward either your publication indemnifying you entirely or what's called um, a mutual indemnification where you would essentially be brought in under the publication's, um, you know, legal action um, to defend you from, you know, a libel lawsuit or something like that. Um, in terms of having these conversations and looking out for these 
clauses. I think that there are, you know, a number of sort of negotiation strategies. And I think the biggest one is just to talk to other people before you go to the contract team and say like, here are my requests in legalese, right? To, to sort of say, you know, you have this clause, I want it this way um, and kind of offer a point by point, um, you know, restructuring of the contract. Um, I think also too, that there is sort of, uh, you know, a very clear kind of emotional appeal in some of these cases where you can just say to somebody like, this story is extremely precious to me. You know, it's something I've been working on for a long time or, or something that, you know, relates to all of the other work I do. Um, and so it's really important to me to maintain some rights to this. And I think that, you know, a lot of times um, individuals and organizations do want to help and will do their best to kind of negotiate this with you. It's just that the organization itself has been structured around this first rights model um, in which, you know, your, your work is sort of no longer your own. So like I said, truly do reach out um, if, if this other, you know, if this is ever a situation you enter into. Um, but just always, yeah, keep in mind the kind of work for hire and indemnification questions um, as you read through your contracts. So once you've signed your contract, um, you know, you produce your story. So you turn in the first draft that kind of makes good on everything you've discussed with your editor so far. And at that stage, you enter into editing rounds. Um, and, you know, these can range from one to what feels like a hundred. Um, in reality, probably I would say most stories, uh, you know, are going to be in sort of a three edit zone where you go back and forth three times to kind of refine a piece. Um, oftentimes these edits take place in Google Docs. I think that's kind of the default of the industry today um, so that there can be that kind of simultaneity, you know, if people need to be in the doc at the same time. Um, there's a few cases where your editor might be the one to convert it into Microsoft Word, um, but I think that, you know, sharing the story in Google Docs is a good default. Um, obviously, it's important that, you know, even though you can see your editor working in a Google Doc, you let them finish and reach out to you before you, um, you know, accept their suggestions um, or start making changes to the story. Um, I think a great editor is going to be somebody who has a bunch of line edits for you in the story, you know, peppers you with sort of questions and kind of stress tests your ideas, but packages that all to you in an email overview that says, you know, this was great. It excels in these ways. These are the things that I want to do and kind of gives you a, a, almost a vision document of like, here's how we're going to move forward with these edits. So you don't want to ever jump the gun on their edits um, and you want to give that process the time that it takes. Um, always though here, right, you have this sort of challenge of balancing what is probably going to be really good feedback because an editor, as we've discussed all the way through, right, is someone who's just, you know, laser focused on serving an audience. So they're going to be saying, you know, my audience, I don't think is going to know this word. They're not going to know this concept. You know, can we explain, can we cut? Um, but you also have to balance that with your own sort of authenticity, right? Like this is your byline, this is your name on this story. And so it has to be something that you feel represents you in the light that you want to be seen. And also, of course, we always have these concerns of accuracy, like you don't want to be putting out any story that you don't feel um, is, you know, 100% accurate. Um, so that, that's always kind of a, a fine line to walk. And I think that editors are sensitive to the idea that, you know, this is something Thing that you've put together and that they need to be respectful of and that it also needs to come out correctly. Um, but my sort of sense is that, you know, most edits can probably just be taken as much as it's painful to sort of have somebody, you know, muck around with your draft. Um, and that the few edits that you need to have a conversation about where you're saying like, oh, okay, like this actually isn't going to be correct if we make this change. Or, you know, I feel like this, this sort of is like in, you know, inauthentic and, and kind of compromising me. Um, those are always conversations you can have, right? You just need to sort of detail out your case. And if your editor is able to make a convincing argument back to you that no, actually this will be okay. I think it's sort of then up to you to kind of trust um, that they're probably right. Um, we talked briefly right in the kind of question session about this idea of stories getting killed. So a publication accepting a story and then never running it or formally um, you know, telling you this isn't going to work, we're going to kill this story. But stories can also be pulled. And by that I mean, you know, in, in sort of those rare scenarios where you feel like you're being asked to put something out that doesn't meet your own personal standards. Just because you sign a contract doesn't actually mean that that story has to be published. You are always in a position to say, I've shut it down, never mind, thanks for the opportunity. And of course, you have to be sort of aware, like, 
interpersonally about the consequences of that, right? You, you probably will have a hard time working with that editor again if you pull a story out from underneath them, um, but that's always an option. And I think it's just important to know as you start to put yourself out into the world in this way that you have a lot of um, sort of power here uh, and that, you know, that using that power strategically to make sure that you're putting out work that you think you can really stand by is, um, I think the best way to be approaching all of these individual assignments you may one day have. Um, and then finally, as you go through this editing process, this is sort of a craft question, um, but you know, I think that you wanna just do multiple reads for yourself. Hopefully your editor is somebody who has enough time that they're going through and very methodically kind of analyzing the story in all of these dimensions. But a typical editor is running between five stories a day and 10 stories a week, like they're going fast. And so it's kind of on you to some degree to be the precious one about this, right? And to just keep going through the story and saying like, you know, is the content that I want to be there, there, right? Have I actually communicated the idea I set out to share? Um, you know, are, are my sentences um, strong and muscular? Is my grammar, you know, active and precise? And is the, the sort of, you know, idea I'm communicating accurate, both in its details and its sort of, um, you know, broader takeaway? Um, so that's kind of like that editing process, like I said, probably three back and forths to get a story finalized. Um, and then you have these final steps. So depending on the publication, what happens is that you and your editor agree the story is done, right? You're like, hopefully we both love it. We're so excited about it. And it's kind of a can kick down the road. Very rarely is a story independently fact-checked these days. Um, pretty much only print magazines have fact checkers. Um, the rest of the time it's going to be on you to make sure that your story is accurate. Um, but sometimes you will have an independent fact checker. So you might wanna find out from your editor, right? Sort of the newsroom style, like are they gonna do an independent fact check or will that be on you and build time just for fact checking in if it's on your end. Um, and then if there is an independent fact checker, like thank God, that's amazing. Um, someone else is going to be, you know, kind of um, verifying this for you. Um, most of the time, a story will be copy edited. And so someone's just going to go through and look specifically for those sort of grammar questions and house style um, to make sure that, you know, the, the story conforms to usually AP style, the associated press style, um, if it's a newspaper, and then also sort of like all of the different individual outlets have their own kind of standards. Um, an editor is also going to usually be the one setting up art um, that will accompany the story, whether this is photos, illustrations, infographics, et cetera. Um, although I suspect, as we saw with that Smithsonian pitch, that the writer did a lot of work to get those photos and um, those permissions to run those photos of the agar art. So that's something that you can be involved in and in talking to your editor about, if, especially if you feel like your piece has a strong visual component. Um, and then the last step is that, you know, when it's published, uh, your sort of your own promotional team. And this is also another sort of one of those potentially uncomfortable tasks to be a little self-promotional, but I think it's a good thing to have on your kind of business checklist, right? Of if you want to sort of build up your reputation as somebody who's, you know, doing this kind of science writing, it's important to get your story out there. Um, and so, you know, you want to be kind of promoting it maybe by emailing it to people who are in your field, who, you know, would be interested if you are on social media, various kinds, you know, promoting it there. Um, whatever works for you. And then the last step is usually to invoice. Um, and so that's when, you know, you would just uh, sort of send along um, a little template filled out saying, you know, we agreed to $500 or this word rate. Um, and here is the, the kind of final amount. And so you send that directly to your editor in most cases. Um, they will let you know about invoicing procedures. Um, but that, you know, sort of seals the deal. Like the payment is on its way. Your story is out and promoted. And um, hopefully not too much time has elapsed. Um, I would say that in most cases, it takes at least two weeks to get a pitch accepted. I would say in most cases, it probably takes at least two weeks to go through those three rounds of edits, if not more. And then even once the story is finalized, um, a lot of times it's probably going to take another week on top of that um, to actually get it out there. So what I'm describing is probably an average of a five week sort of timeline. And that's kind of best case scenario. There are as I said, you know, our situations where stories get 
sort of pushed off for other reasons. Um, but hopefully this whole process will kind of unfold over the course of five weeks. And then you will get your money and you will get a clip and you will be able to say to people, look, I made this amazing story. Um, so are there any questions at this stage? Okay, so I have a question. Is it a good strategy to pitch the same story to multiple editors? How long should we wait for the editor to respond before going to another outlet? This is a great question. And um, one, I think we all want a more scientific answer to. So the thing about what's called simul pitching is that there is a little bit of a taboo about it in journalism um, that I think is a holdover from like analog days where if you were writing um, you know, for a newspaper or a magazine, they were going to be taking potentially months to respond to you about a story. And so simul pitching was like absolutely under no circumstances acceptable because what if they accepted your story, but it was just like still in the mail, the notification, right? And then you'd sold it to somebody else, huge, huge conflict. But in the digital age, basically, I think we just kind of have a residue of that where people still are sort of like, oh, I don't know, like, should we be allowed to simul pitch? Um, so I recently did a Twitter poll about this among editors um, in science communication. And I think 97% were okay with simul pitching as long as you were explicit that you were sending it out to multiple editors simultaneously. And that was especially true for stories that were timely. So if you were pitching something that was tied to an event, um, a study publishing or something along those lines, um, and you were running down a clock, they were like, go for it. Um, the probably 3% of holdouts are people who just want to feel as if the pitch is really tailored to them and really special and couldn't go anywhere else. You know, it's for this one magazine only. Um, so you might run into them occasionally, but in general, I think it's okay to simul pitch. And, um, and I think it's a good strategy too, because otherwise you will be sort of sitting on a pitch for a very long time. Um, if you are sitting on a pitch to answer the second part of this question, um, I would say, I usually follow up with an editor if I haven't heard from them at the one week mark. And I say, if I don't hear from you by this time next week, I'm gonna move on. So two weeks with each editor, which is why simul pitching is great because then you can just like multiply that process instead of doing two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. Um, until the story is no longer interesting to you uh, or anyone else. So are there other questions about sort of these like business considerations um, that I can address? These have all been great, very, very practical. Okay, awesome. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to share with our final few minutes is that I know that we have been through a lot these last few weeks, lots of information. Um, all of these uh, slides are going into um, one shared with SciComm ambassadors and you will have access to them in perpetuity. I'm not gonna be taking them away at any point. So I hope that they're eternally useful to you. Um, but I wanted to offer some additional resources. First, I see that Sherry said, you know, how many pitches do you have going at once? Um, and I, I will answer that question first. Um, so I think that it obviously depends on how much time that you're dedicating to pitching. In my case, as someone who does this full time, I have probably five pitches circulating at any given time. My suggestion is that as you start out, Kind of think of this as like stepwise self-development of managing multiple projects simultaneously and just start out with one right just like get that initial project done see sort of like this whole cycle i'm talking about in terms of edits and contracts and like all of that and once you feel like you have that under your belt yeah maybe start doing two or three at a time um but you just want to make sure that whatever you have out there you have a sort of schedule in mind of how you could execute on it in a timely fashion because a lot of times an editor gets excited about a story when they finally read your pitch and they're like, how soon can we do this? And you wanna be able to answer that question um, and not be to totally like, oh my God, I, I actually can't do this for two more months. I've sent too many pitches, which has happened to me. It's also a bit of a learning curve. So the, yeah, the resources that I wanted to share was, um, so we, we looked at the Open Notebooks pitch database today. They provided our case studies, um, but they have so many other uses. Um, just tons of resources, great articles from science communicators. Like it is specifically just dedicated to science communication. Um, so I would recommend their Getting Started in Science Journalism Toolkit, which I link here. 
Um, and when you have sort of the slides for yourself, you can open up. I also keep personally a freelance 101 doc that I share with um, writers that compiles um, a lot of resources, also like my pitch template, all of those things in one place. Um, and so I'm sharing that with everyone as well. Um, that'll be available to you. And another suggestion I had was that um, if you haven't already come across it, the long form podcast is an amazing resource for writers. They do all kinds of writing, but there are obviously a sort of regular um, rotation of incredible science journalists who come on. And what they do is they do like a 40 minute to one hour interview with um, a given writer. So the Ad Young episodes, Mary Roach was on recently, Brooke Jarvis at the New York Times Magazine. They all talk just about how they find their stories, um, how they execute on them, sort of uh, you know what their kind of goals are for writing. Um, and I think it's great just to hear different perspectives. I, I definitely tried to offer you as much as I could about my own perspective, but to scale that I think is the best thing you can do because there are just so many things possible um, in science writing and you know, you'll find your own path, but it's nice to have models. The last thing I wanted to say was that I kept meaning to say this in our craft conversation and forgetting. So when we were talking about how to figure out how to kind of condense information, right? How to make sure that it's appropriately tailored to an audience and that you're not saying too much or too little. I think that Wired's five level video series is the answer. Like it is so incredible. Um, what they do is they take an expert and they have them explain in five levels of difficulty. I think child, high school, college, grad student and expert, the same topic. And so you're watching kind of how the conversation changes. And, you know, it's very analogy heavy sort of in the beginning, right? Trying to give younger people kind of a concrete way of thinking through these, you know, scientific concepts. And then, and I think this is just fascinating. I'm sure you've all experienced this in your own work, but it's, it's awesome to watch. By the time you get to an expert level conversation, the sort of details have fallen away and people are having a philosophical conversation about like what it means to do this kind of work. Um, and I think that that sort of speaks to the full range of science communication, right? Where you can be explaining a concept to somebody or you can be talking about what a concept means for, you know, humankind. Um, so I would really encourage you if they're interesting to just, I don't know, watch as many of these as you can. Also, all of the little kids are really cute and often smarter than the sort of college students. <laughs> they really get it. Um, so, you know, that has been, I guess, our, our SciComm Ambassadors series. Obviously, I'll be meeting in the small group with everyone next week, but please do reach out. This is my email, my Twitter. You can DM me, however you want to reach out, because um, I, I would really love to continue to be a resource to everyone. It was great to meet you all and, you know, be able to share a little bit. Um, so yeah, so please, please do reach out. And thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been really fun.